Now, this is a story all about how, well, I got a new lathe. It's a very old lathe, actually. It's from the 40s. It's the South Bend 9-inch lathe. This was given to me by my father-in-law, who was an oil field mechanic and had this kind of in the back of one of his garages. He needed the room, and he knew that I was into this, so he let me have it, and I went and picked it up. Mechanically speaking, this lathe is in great condition. Nothing appears to be broken. Everything seems to move relatively smoothly. The surfaces are in otherwise good condition, except for, as you can tell, they're pretty dirty and covered with a little bit of rust. After getting most of the major construction done in my workshop and the lathe was in its new home, I decided to go ahead and give it its due cleanup. This was just going to start as kind of a broad, get all the surfaces clean and get it up and running as is, but the more I got into it, the more it appeared that I was going to have to take it all the way apart. As far as disassembly of the machine goes, it was fairly straightforward, one major component right after the other. And there's a, a lot of information on the internet that helped me, and I'll make sure to share it with you later in the video for, for these lathes. Removing a lot of the screws that held things together was a little bit difficult with a regular screwdriver. These old screw heads had huge slots in them that a lot of modern screwdrivers would really just tear up. So I was using, I actually used a socket wrench and a ratchet handle for a lot of these screws with a gunsmithing bit in it. After kind of taking one bolt out after another and taking all the major components off, you could really see both how much dirt and rust were on the lathe, but also how great a lot of the surfaces really were underneath. None of the rust went very deep. There was really no pitting to speak of. There's a lot of dirt like this that luckily can be taken care of with some mineral spirits and elbow grease. And that's what the bulk of this project really was. Aside from taking the thing apart and putting it back together again, which were their own challenges, this was really just a lot of scrubbing with mineral spirits and Brillo pads and steel wool and brushes. Now my regular viewers know that for every project up to this, I've used a little mini lathe, a Grizzly benchtop 7-inch lathe. So this is quite the step up for me, and every component is heavy and sturdy and stout. It's terrific. I love it. I ended up setting up a little makeshift table in the middle of my shop. This is just a half sheet of plywood on some cheap shelves, and it kind of became a little spread out and scrub station. I ended up using a number of horizontal surfaces in my shop for this. The gearbox I'm just hitting with engine cleaner here and trying to give it an initial scrub. It was pretty dirty. I think it had a lot of original oil and grease in it. The lathe had been repainted at some point in its life. It was covered in a black paint over what was left of the South Bend Gray, and this paint came off very easily. As I was cleaning up major components, it became very obvious to me that I was going to have to basically bring it back down to bare metal and repaint it. This wasn't an option I was really looking forward to at the beginning of this project, but it became kind of an inevitability. Here you can see the original scraping marks on the ways of the lathe. This would be under the headstock, but you can see those marks on other parts of the lathe as well. These lathes are full of taper pins that really only go in their holes one direction, and to drive them out, you need to know which direction they're facing. The wrong strike on one can turn a pin right into a rivet, and that's why it's really best to avoid using steel at all costs. I use some soft steel small punches for the very small pins carefully, but for everything else, I try to use a piece of brass. Getting the spindle out of the headstock wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. I used a piece of brass with threaded ends and some nuts on the ends with pieces of wood as pads. I used a piece of pipe as a spacer and then just screwed the two nuts together and it slid the spindle right out of the headstock. All thread would be ideal for this operation, but I couldn't find the piece that I had. Now here you can see the inside of the headstock and there's no bearings, it's just a precision machined surface inside the cast iron. The spindle is oiled by these pieces of felt, and as I started pulling these out of a lot of the parts of the lathe, I noticed they were in kind of bad condition. The gearbox definitely gave me the heebie-jeebies to try to take apart, although I got a lot of help online from a bunch of resources, so that was good. It wasn't as bad as I thought, although I didn't get any footage of it, so I'm sorry about that. 
The apron was another pretty complex assembly to disassemble. It has a lot of things going on with it. This is the Model A lathe, which means that it has power cross feed, power feed, as well as threading. There's also an oiler system that basically has its own gasket. It's an oil bath in the very bottom, and it actually has a manual clutch for engaging of the power feed and power cross feed. And this took a little bit of figuring out, but again, online there's a lot of really helpful resources for figuring that kind of stuff out. With the major components disassembled, I can start removing what's left of the two different colors of paint on there, and I'm using a product called Citrus Strip. Basically, you just spread this stuff all over the surface that you want to get rid of paint or whatever on, and you let it sit for a while, and then you remove it however you like. I tried using a power washer at first to try to blow away all the crap and stuff, but at the end of the day, the real hero was just a wire brush and some effort. For getting rid of the surface rust on a lot of parts, like this four-jaw chuck, I'm using a product called Evapo Rust, and basically I'm just soaking the part in this stainless steel pot and keeping it submerged for about 24 hours. And then it's a pretty simple wipe down and clean up afterwards. I use just a towel and a Brillo pad. And it's definitely worthy of note to mention that after I got all these metal surfaces clean, all of them, even the painted ones, I gave them a healthy coating of WD-40 so they wouldn't re-rust. Now if you're ever wondering what a 40s era South Bend 9 inch lathe looks like all nulled out, well, look no further. This was a little intimidating to have all the parts laid out like this, but I was told by other machine rebuilders that if you organize your parts like this, it's easier come time to put that back together. All I'm happy with is the fact that they're ready for paint and we can move on and stop having to clean stuff. The paint prep process involved basically soaking the part in acetone to get the protective oil off of the bare metal, and then covering up all the machined surfaces with blue painter's tape. Now, this tape, I don't know who made it, but it wasn't great at keeping its crisp edges. I wanted to make sure, however, though, that as little paint as possible got into all the bearing surfaces, like you can see here in the gearbox. Now, the paint I went with is just an oil-based enamel. It's Rust-Oleum from off the shelf at a hardware store. Now, there's a lot of excellent information all over the internet about how, what kind of paints to use and how to even mix the proper colors to match the original South Bend gray. I didn't do that, obviously. One thing that I wish I had done was to mix in a hardener that you can buy. It helps the paint cure and strengthen in a fraction of the time that it normally takes. There's also debate as to whether or not using a primer is really necessary. I mean, I'm sure it would be better. I didn't. I just went with paint right on the bare metal, and it came out okay. Some people use a spray gun instead of a brush, and that probably would have also made it a lot more of an even finish. As it is, this did require a few touch-up sessions after fully curing out, and that was fine. There's also the color, and well, I just saw a picture of a white South Bend lathe once and thought it looked really sharp. After all the paint had dried, then the last step, obviously, is to reassemble the lathe. This is where taking video of this entire process really benefited for me because I could see how most of the parts, well, how they came apart so I could put them back together. Now the big parts went together easily enough. The little ones took a little bit more figuring out and tinkering. I'd be absolutely lying to you if I told you that it took less than two or three attempts with each one of these to get it all the way together and functioning. I usually had to disassemble it and reassemble it a couple of times. <laughs> Now, I'd like to thank a few other YouTube creators for the stuff they've put out there that got me through a lot of different problems and issues. Mr. Pete 222 is somebody we all know. He also goes by Tubalcane, and he is a shop teacher that has taught many of us a lot of basic machine shop skills here on YouTube. He has a series on the South Bend 9-inch lathe where he goes through a lot of the major components and how to clean them. He also goes through the oiling procedures and some of the different types of oils you can use in the South Bend lathe. Very handy, very helpful, and helped me figure out a few things. Greg Halligan, aka Halligan142 here on YouTube, has a number of videos on the South Bend 9-inch lathe that I found really helpful. He's got some like taking the spindle out of the headstock or aligning the tailstock, and one I found really useful was the spindle needle bearing mod and, and the part numbers to get those from McMaster Carr. 
Brad Jacobs, aka Basement Shop Guy here on YouTube, has done a lot of South Bend restores. Full tilt, he has contributed a lot to the South Bend restore community. You can find posts of his on the Practical Machinist forum that outline what specific oils you can buy that match the original South Bend specs, as well as he's figured out an exact recipe for South Bend's gray paint color. He's got a number of videos on South Bend lathes from 9 inch all the way up to I think 13 or 16 inch lathes and he has done a number of restores and he's definitely a valuable resource. Last but most certainly not least is a smaller YouTube channel by the name of Captain Jamie. Go check him out. He's got an entire series on breaking down and putting back together a South Bend 9 inch lathe much like I did only his is far more in depth and his videos of reassembling the apron and the gearbox really helped me when it came time to do that myself. Uh, he's a really nice guy and he's got a great channel and his lathe is blue, which I really dig. I, I like the non-traditional colors. But those are some of the best resources that I had while working on this lathe and you should go check them out for sure if you haven't already. To loosen and tighten the nuts that hold on the handles for the cross slide and the compound rest, I made a little spanner out of an old cheap crescent wrench that fit pretty well. It's not ideal, but it's better than using a pry bar. The paint is something I did fight with on the reassembly process. I had to scrape a lot of it away because, like I said, it bled through underneath the tape. And I also ended up causing a few issues with it during reassembly by marring it, usually hammering pins in or just fitting parts together. So you'll see a lot of scuffs and scrapes that I had to go back and touch up with just a little artist's paintbrush. The power crossfeed drive, the selector switch, and its clutch are actually relatively straightforward to put together, although they can really only go together in one way. And that is one order, I should say. So if you forget something, say the second or third step, you need to undo the entire process. Ask me how I know this sometime. Speaking of going together only one way, however, the lathe is actually really refreshing to put back together because a lot of the parts will only fit the part that they're meant to fit. Basically, I didn't run into putting the wrong gear or the wrong handle or the wrong screw anywhere, really, which is really refreshing. I've had that issue with other machines and equipment. The replacement gasket that came with my kit of felt wicks for the oilers, I added a little bit of black RTV and it fits underneath that little plate right there and that forms basically a trough for oil to sit in for that little clutch assembly. Putting the spindle back in the headstock was just like taking it out of the headstock. I just had to clean up some of the machine surfaces to get the paint off. Now these brand new felt oiler wicks I could put in and then hold down with a pin through this hole in the front. That kept them out of the way while we put the spindle in. Once the spindle's back in place, I replaced a fiber washer on the back of it with this needle bearing mod. This is something I mentioned that Greg Halligan has a video on. And the parts are really inexpensive, and that's meant to take up the forward and back play in the spindle. And using a needle bearing gives you a lot more freedom than the fiber washer did. Reassembling the gear train on the back of the headstock was one of the things that made me very happy I took a lot of pictures before taking it apart. Getting the back gears installed was a little bit of a challenge, mostly because I just kept doing it completely wrong. It's actually fairly straightforward once you figure out where the taper pins are supposed to fit, and then get it all properly lined up. There's two eccentric bushings that fit on the lugs on the headstock you can see there, and you need to line up perfectly with the taper pins, 
And then there's a small slot that you adjust a set screw in that more or less adjusts the travel of your back gears to make sure that you don't over or under mesh them when they're engaged. You can see some of the very original hand scraping marks there on the base for the tailstock, and I'm being very mindful of them as I very gently go along the edge and clean up that paint. The spindle for the tailstock, as well as a lot of the hand wheels and other uh, high polish items, I actually ended up taking to my buffing wheel. They were in really good condition after cleanup, but they could really use that final luster, and I gave them just a little bit of a polish, and I'm really happy I did because it also made them a lot smoother. As more sub-assemblies get put together, it, they get added to the lathe. Now, as I'm reassembling everything, I'm giving it a nice coating of oil, and South Bend is actually pretty particular about what kind of oil you put where. In fact, they recommend four different oils for this particular lathe. I have to thank Brad Jacobs for coming up with their modern equivalents and where to find them. That information I will pass along to you in the description. Not stress enough how happy I am that I took a lot of pictures of the gearbox before taking it apart. You can see here that I had to replace a lot of the felt wicks. It's got a number inside of it. The gearbox is probably the part of the lathe that gave me the most challenge. Lining up this particular set of gears was incredibly difficult because there is a pin that you need to align them with, and also a key that you need to align them with, and they ended up being blind in there, so it was really easy to misalign one gear and cause a huge problem. Eventually got it in place though, and then the rest of the components of the gearbox could fit in around those gears. I feel the need to point out again that anytime I'm hitting something with a hammer, I'm using a soft hammer and or a brass drift so that I'm not striking steel on steel and causing something to either mar, mushroom, bend, anything of the like. It's something that uh, I tried to take very, very, very good care in, in doing. It was amazing that I got the entire gearbox back together and fully functional turning, although I did end up having to take it back apart and turn one gear around. Turns out there was a wrong way to put it in. Now this banjo that the idler gears sit on actually had to be repaired by my father-in-law when he owned the lathe. It was re-welded after it had broken from falling off of a truck, and I gotta be honest, I can barely tell that there's a seam in there, so whoever did that weld repair did a fantastic job. The motor mount assembly was actually the last part to get assembled, and after doing the gearbox and the apron, it was quite the breeze, let me tell you. Getting it all together and mounted was a lot easier, and it went together pretty smoothly. With some smacking. 
I'm not sure what the situation is with the giant flame cut plates on top of the mounting legs for this lathe. I think they're maybe replacing a chip pan or something. I'm not entirely sure, but that's just how it came to me and it seems to work, so I'm not going to bother with it. The motor itself was also replaced at some point in the lathe's life. It is a half horsepower, I believe garage door motor is what I was told. And it was wired up to its own switch. The tensioner here has also been repaired at some point and just replaced with a bent piece of all thread. Uh, again, it's not original, but it works. And so I'm not probably ever going to mess with it. I'm like 90% sure that I probably should have mounted the motor before putting the entire arm on the lathe, but eh, whatever. Now, during reassembly, I had actually discovered that the left gear guard here, the one that actually holds the switch, had a broken tab on it. So the forward screw that screws it into the front of the headstock doesn't really have anything to bite onto, so it's just kind of hanging there by the top screw, and it seems to be mostly stable for now. I'll probably address it in the future. And the switch is something that's obviously not original to the lathe as well. It's just a commercial box that you can get at any hardware store, and it's wired for forward and reverse for this motor. The original wiring job for this switch seemed really solid, although I did decide to just use some heat shrink tubing to replace the electrical tape that was on there in the first place. It cleans it up a little bit, and hopefully it's a little bit stronger. I took about 15 or 20 pictures of the wiring for the switch before taking it apart in the first place. I'm really glad I did. I'm not an electrician. I know the very basic fundamentals of electricity, but I was really happy that my pictures allowed me to get this together right on the very first try. Now, the lathe came to me with a link belt that was made out of leather, and it was unfortunately a little bit too fat to fit between the V-grooves of the spindle and the headstock, so I couldn't change speeds. I replaced it with this belt that I got from, well, from Harbor Freight, and it seems to work pretty decently, although I do get a little bit of slippage, so I think it'll need some adjustment. The cool part, however, was after all this hard work, a month's worth of nights and weekends and scrubbing and painting and cursing, it was really cool to flip the switch and see my lathe turn. Even better was that all the features of the lathe were also functional, such as the power cross feed and the power feed. The lead screw also seems to be turning accurately with regards to the settings on the gearbox, and as you can see, the paint is really, really good at showing me exactly where all the dirty oil goes, so that's just terrific. Now we got a lot done, and there's still just a couple more tasks to get done in the next few days. I got a quick change tool post that needs mounted. Of course, a three-jaw chuck is necessary. I need to get a backsplash hung behind the lathe because there's already oil and stuff getting splattered on the wall. I got a thread chasing dial that I 3D printed and I need to get that mounted to the lathe so we can cut threads. And I want to make leveling feet so I can get the lathe leveled up and aligned properly. So definitely hit that subscribe button if you haven't already because in the future there's a lot of projects coming out full steam ahead. Definitely stay tuned for more stuff for this lathe specifically and I can't wait to use this lathe for a variety of other projects here in my home workshop. Anyway, thanks for watching.